Uh, last but not least is um, our, our closing remarks. And um, I'm sure I don't take the time to share this. Um, but Steve Tabachman, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I, I call him, he doesn't know this, I call him crazy genius. Uh, yes, I actually do call you crazy genius behind your back. Um, he really had the vision to, um, to bring this program to Detroit. And um, if not for that vision, and if not for um, the time that he took to kind of scour the country to look for something um, that he thought was appropriate for Detroit and that could move Detroit neighborhoods forward, um, we may not be here today. Um, so I, I, I really do call you crazy genius. Um, I have a lot of respect for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. Um, and I'd like to ask you to come up and give our closing remarks. Steve Tabachman. So I'm, um, I'm a, politi a, f a recovering politician and a lawyer. <laughs> And I don't get a lot of opportunities to have a mic and an audience, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, but Kim, um, first of all, thank you very much for those kind remarks. And um, I'm just really looking forward to our uh, work together in the coming year. And, and I, I just am so inspired by um, the work that you do and, and the work that the program does. And, but I have to say, you know, putting me on the agenda after Mahilo, who is truly one of my heroes. Uh, I've worked in community development for 20 years, and, and you rank literally right at the top of the list of practitioners. And then Nana, after Nana, I mean, I have to follow that. And then Valerie and her kid, and uh, you know, that's just not fair. <laughs> and I know there's a revenge factor in there somewhere. <laughs> um, no, but um, it is a privilege to be here. And, um, if I can be a little serious for a moment, you know, uh, it is, uh, let's not lose the fact of where we are. We're in Detroit, Michigan. It's 2014. This city has uh, faced bankruptcy. We've had our own uh, Katrina, if you will. It's been described in our neighborhoods. Um, you know the statistics. Um, half of our children live in poverty. We probably have the highest murder rate in the country. We lost a quarter of our population in the last decade alone. It's been a 50-year uh, issue of decline. Um, some statistics that came out recently from the Detroit Future City study is that, you know, that 61% uh, of the Detroiters with jobs actually work in the suburbs, and only 39% of the uh, residents who work work in the city, and that of the jobs that exist in the city of Detroit, only 30% are held by Detroiters, and 70% of our jobs are held by suburbanites or commuters. Um, we only have 27 jobs per 100 residents in the city, and that is about the lowest of any major American city. 2% of the new jobs expected to be created over the next uh, of the 300,000 new jobs expected to be created in this region over the next 10 years are to go to Detroiters. And whites own 85% of the businesses in the city of Detroit. You know that there's been a lot of talk about revitalization, a lot of talk about entrepreneurship and what it can do, a lot of talk about investing and turning the corner in our neighborhoods. But I submit that prosperous Detroit is at the forefront, it's at the vanguard um, of what is needed in this city. And I'll um, turn to the Detroit Future City study that we spent millions of dollars on for the future vision of the city. And one of the imperatives, in fact the number one imperative is the economic imperative. And it says we must re-energize Detroit's economy to increase job opportunity for Detroiters within the city and to strengthen the tax base. And there's five strategies under that, including encouraging local entrepreneurship and minority business particip participation. Well, this is a pretty auspicious undertaking. And as I said, I, I submit that the work that you individually are doing is the solution, is the vanguard, is the forefront, is the pinnacle of what people are talking about in terms of dealing with perhaps America's you know, most significant urban crises. Um, and it's, it's uh, an auspicious undertaking, and it's very appropriate, and I don't know how much you thought about this, that we are sitting here at Focus Hope, 
um, and I don't know how much people know about the incredible history here at Focus Hope, but uh, and the post-race riots, whatever you want to call them, rebe acts of rebellion. But, you know, we had um, riots here in the city that related to the kind of urban crisis and the racial strife and the inequalities and the injustices that existed close to 50 years ago. And out of that, Father Cunningham uh, and Eleanor Jositis and others came together and, you know, I'm shocked. I don't know, Judith, it, I don't see it on the wall in this room, but my experience of being here at Focus Hope is that the mission is on the wall of every single room in this building. And, <laughs> and maybe it's hidden, but I'm going to read it for you because it is a pretty incredible mission. And this is what, and, and um, you know, sometimes when Kim, Kimberly and I and the team get behind closed doors, you know, we, we're frustrated with each other, with... With the, with the program, with the with the situation we find ourselves in, and I think um, I imagine if I ever worked at Focus Hope, I would be frustrated every day, because let me tell you what their mission is. Okay, it's a little ridiculous. Um, recognizing the dignity and beauty of every person, we pledge intelligent and practical action to overcome racism, poverty and injustice. So I'm going to pause there, but these people are, their mission is to overcome poverty, racism, and injustice, okay? To build a metropolitan community where all people may live in freedom, harmony, trust, and affection. Black and white, yellow, brown and red, from Detroit and its suburbs of every economic status, national origin, and religious persuasion, we join this covenant. That was written on March 8th, 1968. If you think about what we're up to, what you're up to in creating your businesses in your neighborhoods and what Prosperous is up to in creating more businesses in these neighborhoods, it's not just an entrepreneurial initiative, but it's an entrepreneurial initiative exactly designed for the challenges that we face here in the city of Detroit. And we are really lucky that there's some brilliant people in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, and some hardworking and committed people who have created a model that is based on um, valuing the individual, that is based on respect, and that is based on revitalizing communities. You know, they, they use the phrase, untap the hidden talent, or tap the hidden uh, talent in these neighborhoods. And that is, that is really what we're doing. I mean, we are not Prosperous is not designed to do anything but get the barriers out of the way for the natural talent that exists in our communities to prosper. And it puts entrepreneurs first in these neighborhoods. The NDC mission um, is that, and I just want to read this because frankly it is, if I were to design, an, if I were to stand in the shoes of Father Cunningham and design an entrepreneurship initiative, this is probably what I would design. NDC believes that residents, small businesses, and neighborhood groups in all communities have the talent, energy, and ability to engage and revitalize their own communities. So we are simply up to tapping the talent that exists in our neighborhoods, and we believe that that talent and entrepreneurship is enough. We don't need a huge government program. We don't need to fix the gov uh, downtown government. We don't need to and the kind of leadership we might have in Lansing or in Washington, D.C., we actually are looking at the talent. You are the talent in this room to revitalize our neighborhoods, your neighborhoods, and that's kind of what we're up to. And when you think of that talent, energy, and ability, you know, some of it will occur in the businesses that cr you create and the legacies that you leave to your children and the jobs that you create for your neighbors, and some of it will happen in different ways. And I know that many of you who were in the Sarah Metro class, you know, supported one of your colleagues who was going to open a gelato store, and she apologized that she couldn't be here tonight, uh, but, um, but she's now one of our city council members, uh, Raquel Castaneda Lopez, a graduate of the Prosperous Detroit class at Sarah Metro. And if you listen to her acceptance speech at her swearing in, she talked about 
I was going to open a gelato store, and she went to her brother and said, these people keep telling me I have to run, I don't want to run, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a politician, did all this stuff. You know, and this is the first Latino elected to the Detroit City Council in the history of the city of Detroit. And one of the things we do sometimes at NDC and Prosperous is we help people understand the challenges and the realities of owning their own business. And apparently her brother told her, I've tasted your gelato. I think you should run for city council. <laughs> and now she's our city council member. Um, but I, I don't think it's a mistake that she was in the class. You know, and I, I've known Raquel for a while. She was my intern uh, when I was in the state legislature. I don't think it was a mistake. I don't know that she would have run but for the fact that she was in the class. And in a conversation with her neighbors, with cake makers, with others, about uh, their community. And so you guys provided an inspiration to her uh, to run for office and to be a great city council member. So I want to conclude, um, because I don't, just to make it a little more weighty, because I know it's been sort of light in my comments, um, that, um, uh, you know, what we're up to, to me, is, is, is critical, not just in your lives, not just in your neighbors' lives, not just in your communities, but, um, you know, I've had a lot of opportunity and privilege in my life, and, and I've invested the last 20 years of my time in the city of Detroit because I really believe that we work on America's greatest challenges in the, what I consider to be, and I know this is a little jingoistic, the greatest nation on earth at a time of unrivaled prosperity, we still have huge injustices and challenges and it's a privilege to be able to devote my life to trying to to work on those issues and um, and I really think that if you're an American that um, our city is as great of a place as ever to work on um, advancing the human cause well I just want to I, I it's not you know 1968 focus hope I don't know if you realize that uh, 50 years ago this year Lyndon Johnson, uh, six months after uh, Kennedy was assassinated, began talking about this concept of a great society. And apparently in May, at the beginning part of May, was the first time he unveiled the term in a speech. And within a few weeks of that, on May 22nd, 1964, so roughly 50 years ago, uh, he stood at University of Michigan Stadium and he addressed, he addressed 85,000 students in, in Michiganders. And I just want to quote a little bit of what he said because I think it's very relevant to the work that we do at Prosperous, at Global Detroit, at NDC, but also what you guys are up to in providing for your own families and working in your own neighborhoods uh, here in the city of Detroit. So I'm going to read a bunch of this quote. It might take a while. I, 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 it's a three-page speech, but I've cut it down to about a half a page. So bear with me. Um, for half a century, our nation called upon unbounded invention and untiring industry to create an order of plenty for all our people. So from 1914 to 1964, you know, we really went from uh, a developed nation to by far the most rich, the richest nation on, on, the, on the face of the earth. He's talking about now we have this kind of prosperity. The challenge of the next half century so we're now at the end of what he's talking about, is whether we have the wisdom to use that wealth to enrich and elevate our national life and to advance the quality of American civilization. Your imagination, your initiative, your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where old values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. For in your time, we have the opportunity not only to move towards the rich society and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. Our society will never be great until our cities are great. New experiments are already going on. It will be the task of your generation to make the American city a place where future generations will come not only to live, but to live the good life. Sorry. You have the chance never before afforded to any people in any age. You can help build a society where the demands of morality and the needs of the spirit can be realized in the life of the nation. Will you join in the battle to give every citizen the full equality which God enjoins and the law requires, whatever his belief or race or the color of his skin? Will you join in the battle to give every citizen 
an escape from the crushing weight of poverty. So I'm looking at a bunch of people who joined the battle. And I want to thank you for joining the battle. And I want to thank you for whether you're a trainer, whether you're running the program, whether you're a graduate of the program, whether you're a loved one supporting somebody uh, uh, or opening a business in one of our neighborhoods. I want to thank you for joining the battle. And I think the battle is going to be incredible in 2014. So thank you for being here tonight.